So I want to start, since we are here um, in this land, and most of us are descendants of the Jewish uh, nation, I want to start with some, some roots of the mysticism that actually um, is penetrating through Judaism all the way to us. We want to take us really far back. Since humans have been on this planet, humans are fascinated by the mysteries. And humans are fascinated with powers that they know that are beyond just the material life. And this is true to all human beings all over from prehistorical times through all history. Humans created religions. Doesn't matter if you know this story of, of creation or that story of creation. It doesn't matter if it's this god, deity, goddess, it doesn't matter. What's equal is that humans are fascinated by the mysteries. And they find the mysteries in nature, in the shimmering stars, in the rivers, in the mountains, in the forest. Humans started to work with these powers what we might call magic from ancient, ancient times. Also in this land, there were findings from prehistorical times of um, some, some called in science witchcraft uh, crafts, like, you know, bones of animals or, you know, red bulls and stuff like that that proved some kind of um, of uh, rituals that were that were made in very ancient times in shamanic ritual, what we call today shamanic ritual. Of course, they didn't have these names. We were all educated to think about our history, our uh, common history through the eyes of the Bible, which is trying to create a history. There were like, you know, Adam, Adam, Adam and Eve, and the whole story came to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the 12 tribes, and they went to Egypt, and there were slaves in Egypt, and then came Moses, after 400 years of slavery in Egypt, released them from slavery, took them through the desert, the 12 tribes, and they entered the land of their ancestors, conquered it from the Canaanites that lived here, and created later the kingdom of King Saul, Shaul, then David, then the two kingdoms, Judea and Israel. We are here. This specific place is in the which kingdom? Yeah. Israel. Israel, yeah. <laughs> the northern kingdom was here. Um, and then the temple was destroyed. Our people were exiled to the kingdom of Israel was destroyed by the Assyrian people. Disappeared, the twelve tribe, the ten tribe disappeared, and the two tribes of Judea kingdom stayed until the temple was destroyed. They went to exile in Babylon. Seventy years came back, built the second temple. I'm just making a short history of me. <laughs> a short history that you all know from school. And I'm going to tell you how it's wrong. <laughs> it's a long story, but just like to make it. Uh, 
even came back, built the second temple, 500 years ago, <coughs> the second temple, through the Persian, Persian time, through the Greek time, Romans, smashed the temple, and off we go to the 2,000 years of uh, the exile that maybe ended with the state of Israel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, that's the common history that you learn in school. Now, this is all, and it's a narrative, it's a story that was created at a certain time by people who wrote the Bible. The thing is that the people who wrote the Bible were not really our friends. The people who wrote the Bible were the people who killed our friends. And wrote the story. In my book, in Kedusha, I kind of made the, the, the story uh, just to, to portray it, <coughs> to give it more, more, more meat, more smell, more taste, to feel what actually happened here. Because what actually happened here is is that this is like academic science. What I'm going to tell you now. Okay, not a traditional story that you learn in school. Academically, um, research of history is that, yes, there was a little group of people that came here from Egypt. This group that came from Egypt in, in Egypt was called the Habibu. Habibu. Ephraim. This is the source of what today we, we know ourselves as Hebrew. This is why our language is called Hebrew. Hebrew, the Hebrews. The Hebrews were called the Habiru. The Habiru comes from, in, in Egyptian, comes from the outlaws. Also in Hebrew, Ivri and Avera, Avarianim. Basically, our ancestors are Avarianim. <laughs> they are outlaws. There are people who were, who were not submitting to the laws of the pharaohs. They were rebels. Some people, some scholars of Egypt said that they took over the kingdom of, of, for, for a while. That's probably what's in the Torah is portrayed as Yosef, Joseph, that became the king or secondary to the king of Egypt for, for a while. So they took over the kingdom for a while, but then they left and made the journey and came here. But they merged with other people who came from the north, actually, northeast from Mesopotamia. And this portrayed in the Bible as the tradition of our ancestor Abraham coming from Mesopotamia, from what today is Iraq, coming here, bringing the, the gods of that place. Hel is the god of that area. El Elyon, Supreme El, Supreme God. Those groups came together, merged together with people who lived here forever, the Canaanites. We are the descendants of those three groups. The Canaanites were not moved, were not conquered and pushed away from the country, they merged into those other groups. Those other groups created a story that will merge their story of the exodus from Egypt, from the south, bringing the name of Yahweh from the desert. It was the, the name of the god of the desert. This name came from the desert, that's how it's written in Tehidim. And the gods that came from the northeast, merged with all, created the story of those two people, two groups coming together, and created the, um, the laws that you should create a new, and don't walk, don't, don't go in the path of the, of the Canaanites, which were us just before. Nevertheless, 
those parts of the Canaanites were worshipping gods and goddesses of the best of this area. And as we know it for sure, and we know it also from the Bible itself, because the Bible is speaking about it just in a negative way. Our ancestors here on this land were worshipping goddesses big time. It was excavated in archaeology. In Judea, hundreds and hundreds of statues of goddesses were found in the north as well. There are gods and goddesses all over this country. Forget about what you what you think that you know this was a Jewish kingdom. It wasn't a Jewish kingdom, far from Jewish. If King David would land here today, he would like not understand what the fuck is happening here. It's really weird for those people, or anyone, not only him, just like people from that time would not understand Judaism the same as Jesus would not understand what is church. Right? It's like, what the fuck? You know, like, what do you think? The thing is that at a certain time there was a rise up of a new consciousness that wanted to realize oneness beyond all the deities, that there is one God, and this God has no name, and no shape, and no form. And the people who wanted to bring this consciousness started to fight against all those who worship the God, this God is and that God is and this God and that God. And in this battle, they went very much into the abstract. If you can you can think about it, like to, to go into oneness, you go into the abstractization. To go into goddesses and gods and goddesses, you go into actually into nature, you start to animate nature, you go down. But when you want to say like no, there is oneness beyond it all, you go up, you go into the abstractization and you go beyond any form, beyond any name. This consciousness pushed itself into here, created eventually through all that I described in the Shah, um, the scribes, the Sufrim, were a new, a new status that started to come up in these times of scattered people that were not priests. Priesthood was a lineage of the temple. They were not kings, they were a new power that came with intellect. There were there the people who knew how to read and write. Not everybody knew how to read and write. They knew how to read and write in all different languages of the Middle East. And they pushed away the priestesses and the priests of the temple. They killed those guys, burned their temples. The temples that were on, upon every hill, under every fresh tree. That's what the Bible says. Our ancestors were worshipping the goddesses, and this was involving, not only, but also involving sexuality. Upon every hill, under every fresh tree. Just like today, today wherever you go, there is a synagogue here, a mikveh here. That's, that's how it is. That's how it was. Everywhere they were like temples, little temples, shrines. That's what they did. Worshipping the gods and goddesses of nature and sexuality and fertility. Everybody was also took a lot of uh, concern about fertility. It's not only fertility of the body, but also fertility of the fields. Rain, would rain come? <laughs> When the scribes came up to power, there was the revolution of Yoshiyahu, the king Josiah, that came to power. I will not go into the details of that. Everything is written in the in Kedesha. That used the, the theology of the scribes, the power of the king with the army, and 
killed all the priestesses, burned their, their bodies on the altars, created a national trauma, basically. That from this trauma, honestly, we have never recovered. Because what happened, and this is now something we need to understand. From this trauma, the, the nation, imagine the nation that, you know, every people, people, kids, adults, elders, they have their ancient ways, what their grandmothers and grandfathers did, and that's how they know, that's how they know themselves. They go and worship, and also they worship Yahweh together, and they, they think basically that Yahweh is another deity, is another God. It has a shape, it has a form. Uh, they never thought that Yahweh doesn't have a form. There's even scholars like Igor Bilun that claim that actually there was a statue of Yahweh in the, temple, in the ancient time. But then comes the, the scribes, and they come with a new identity, with a new idea. But they have the power of the king, and the king goes and smashes all the, tem all the temple of the nation. Smashes everything, and converts everybody to one God, one belief, one center, only in Jerusalem. The whole, you can imagine how, what a, what a, a crisis it is to the culture and to the spiritual network of the land, of the country, to the people and places, sacred sites. Because what ancient people did, they, they figured, oh, this tree has power. Let's, let's do some little temple here. This hill, oh, this hill is powerful. Let's do it. They, they identified powerful places in the land. They felt the land. They felt the land. The crisis that happened back then, when all this web of the ancient ways, it wasn't a religion, it was just like the ancient ways of, this, of, of our ancestors, when it was destroyed, the crisis created a, a fall of spirit, a fall of power, immediate, immediately after, immediately after, Judea became um, submitted to Egypt, Pharaoh came, killed King Hosea, <laughs> made another king here that's, that had to pay tax to Egypt. It's all written in the Book of Kings. So we basically, Josea, Yoshiao, that was the king that crushed all the ancient temples, was also the last independent king of Judea. Because he was killed by Pharaoh, some scholars say the reason Pharaoh killed him is because Pharaoh had the, the history of Egypt is that there was a king in Egypt, Akhenaton, who created monotheism in Egypt, took the god Aton, one of the gods of Egypt, and said this is the only god that you can worship, Pharaoh Akhenaton. He was killed, and Egypt came back to, to its own old ways. And what scholar says is that when uh, Pharaoh saw, Pharaoh was just passing here. Judea was like a little, little thing on the way between him and between Egypt and Mesopotamia. He was passing here. King Yoshiao came to visit him, but he heard this King Yoshiao bringing back this monotheism thing. Kill this guy. <laughs> and that's all. It was like a smashing a fly on the wall. Kill this guy. Put someone else instead of him, make him pay tax to us. That's it. It's kind of a, that's the end of our independence, of the independence of the liberated tribe. A generation and a half after that, Babylon came, uh, conquered Judea, and this is all you know later. <laughs> so, in, in, a, And what you studied in high school is that the reason for the destruction of the first temple is because of 
Because of uh, idolatry, basically. What I want to claim is that it's completely the opposite. Historically, the reason that the independent kingdom was crushed is because they stopped worshipping the local deities. They stopped listening to the energies of the land. It's not only me saying that. In the book of Yosh, uh, Yosh, uh, uh, Yirmiyahu, Jeremiah, it says that Jeremiah is speaking with the people immediately after Babylon conquered. And he's telling them, you should worship Yahweh. And they tell him, are you crazy? Everything was good before we started to worship Yahweh. Since we stopped worshipping the goddess of heavens, Elat Malkat the, the queen of heavens, everything started to crash. So what are you talking about? So that was, that was also their recognition of things went down when we stopped actually listening, uh, worshipping the goddess, which is actually listening to what's happening in nature. Nevertheless, Judaism was created. And I want to emphasize one thing. Judaism, as you well know, is a religion that doesn't matter where you are, you worship at the same time. Which means where... So, Pesach, Passover, is Chag Aviv, the holiday of spring. But if you are where Bruce lives, in New Zealand, in the southern, southern hemisphere, when do you work according to Judaism? When do you worship? When do you celebrate Pesach? At the same time, when it's in Israel. But is it the holiday of spring? No, they actually have autumn. But so Judaism was created as a religion to go. Is a religion that you can pack and go wherever you go. It doesn't matter. You still worship them instead of the ancient ways that is wherever you are, you listen to what is, you listen to the trees, you listen to nature, you listen to the clouds, you listen, and then you create your way of relating to the mysteries. So Judaism came and created a religion that cut our roots to nature, even though we I mean, here you think you're when you're in Israel, you're in tune. You, you're celebrating Pesach in the, in the holiday of spring, spring, the holiday of spring, of spring, spring. But even when you're in New York, you're sitting in the sukkah when it's snowing outside. I mean, this is a religion that is based on one local place, but basic, basically disconnected us from the power of this place. Now what happened to the mysteries? What happened to the mysteries when this uh, monotheistic um, consciousness came? It went underground. <coughs> the mysteries always just find a way, it's like water. So how do we do that? How do we do that? It went underground and sprouted back through Kabbalah. Mysticism, the ancient mysticism that was connected to the deities of this place, went underground and sprouted back through Kabbalah that showed itself all of a sudden in Jewish mysticism. <coughs> But scholars, Jewish scholars that were not Kabbalists, actually rejected Kabbalah because they said this is idolatry. Kabbalah is idolatry. There were many rabbis that said, what do you mean Kabbalah is idolatry? And pornography. Because Kabbalah is very sexual. And it has all those spirot. What happens is instead of in the ancient ways, 
the, the tree of life that we know today is Sfirat Chesed, Sfirat Nura, this Sfirat, this Sfirat, whereas the tree of life was the different deities, the gods and goddesses it, um, arranged on the tree as a system. El Asherah, Baal and Anat. The ancient mysteries that have been here forever. Just dressed it up in different ways. And different ways that will be accepted by the rebels. When we come today, um, the gift that we have today in, in our days is that we are connected enough to the here to the Jewish tradition, but also disconnected enough <laughs> through the secular uh, revolution re revolution that happened. So we're disconnected enough, and when, when we are drawn back to the mysteries, we're drawn back to religiosity, not to religion, but to religiosity, to the feeling that there is something deep. There's something deeper than me. There's something deeper than the flesh. There's something deeper than materialism. Many of us, like I did, you know, went, go into religion. I spent more than 20 years there. But many of us can also be smart enough not to fall into this pit, but actually to, to realize that what I'm looking for is not the halachic thing and all this, but I'm actually looking for a path into the mysteries. And these mysteries are the mysteries of our ancestors. And they're to be found when we connect deep into this land. So I really want to encourage us to to feel the beautiful tradition that we all have, but also, but not to be fooled by that. To know that this tradition is like when you read when you read the Bible, it's like reading the newspaper of Shas and think this is describing history. <laughs> <laughs> like, like some religious people wrote some story, but this is not describing what's happening. It's through the eyes of some religious people. So good to read it, but read the land. Go back to the land. Read the land. And this land that we are on is a land that was conquered and conquered and conquered. People killed each other on this land again and again, fighting between Elohim and Allah, between this God and that God. But what does the land have to say to us? The land itself, are we actually listening to the rivers, to the mountains? They are so shut down because of thousands of years of different minds conquering this place and telling the story. So with this I'll finish my first uh, uh, delivery of just the calling to listen to the land, which is also the calling to listen to our body. The land is the body of the nation. Listening to our body starts from listening to the land itself, to the stories of the spring and the mountains and the trees.